Good morning and happy Sabbath, Woodside Church family. I'm so glad to see each of you here today on our online presence. And uh, as this is the last Sabbath of the year, I look forward to bringing you encouragement from the Word of God. I'll summarize the year plan and hopefully we'll have a wonderful a time of worship together. Wherever you are, wherever you're joining us, we hope that the magnetic love of God and that the wonderful presence of his son Jesus through the Holy Spirit will be with you today. Will you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Loving God in heaven, we thank you so much for your word and for your encouragement today. We hope and pray that we can be transformed by it today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. The Middle Collegiate Church in New York City was built in 1892 in the East Village, and it was a wonderful historical monument for the people in that area. The pastor was a pastor who loved, is a pastor who talks about reaching out and loving your neighbor as yourself and practicing the golden rule, yet they had a fire in December. And their, their church burned down. And although they've not been meeting in the sanctuary, it was a tremendous loss. No matter what the material thing is, this is the attitude of the members who lost their, their church. No, no matter what the material thing is, what the brick and mortar thing is, that's not Christmas. One member said, Christmas is your spirit connecting with others and lifting them up. And I think that's what Christmas will be this year. As I look back on the year that we've been through, I evaluated the sermon calendar that I, I presented, beginning with the first quarter, where we talked about the second coming in detail for January, February, and March. And we learned that we are waiting for someone, not something. And that someone is our friend, our precious Savior, and our confidant and our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. For the second quarter between in March, we decided to close our church due to the stay-at-home orders from the governor. And I've been since then mostly preaching online and sometimes here as we've had intermittent church services and we're open now for outdoor services. But in quarter two, we evaluated the epistle to Colossians and we discovered that it was also potentially a epistle to the Laodicean church in that area. And Christ declared, Christ defended and Christ displayed was the outline that we went through in Colossians. And we found that it's a wonderful book, magnifying Christ as our almighty Lord. Then in quarter three, I went through the epistle to the Colossian, or to the Ecclesiastes, excuse me, the Old Testament wisdom book of Ecclesiastes. And we learned that the heart of that book is all is vanity, 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 all is vanity and striving after the wind. Yet, in the end, in the final analysis, we should fear God and trust his favorable judgment. I believe that Solomon has that example for us and gave us a wonderful message through the book to the assembly, to the congregation. Fourth quarter, we went through the sermon series, The Compelling Love of God, and we found that that motivates us to a deeper walk with him. If we concentrate on his love for us and evaluate our love for him, we can have a deeper walk with Christ. And the main idea of these sermons is that when we choose to surrender to God's will, Jesus assures us the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. As we replace lies with the truth from the Bible, our lives will be transformed from within. And I've tried to emphasize that assurance that God wants us to have based on his work within us, based on his promise all through scripture to be with us, Emmanuel. And I thank you for Clinton Meharry's studies and continue to refer people to them. You see, Jesus wants us in his kingdom. He has shown us the way he's gone before us. And the great verses in 2 Corinthians 5, 13 through 15, 
were the key passages for this entire fourth quarter. Because if we're trying to do it outside of this motivation, it will be a burden. It will be difficult. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 13, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, the incarnation of Jesus is the greatest miracle that led to our salvation. It is Emmanuel, God with us. It's a beautiful story of God's plan. And it started right from the very foundation of history. And that story included the king of Israel known as King David, the most famous king of Israel, the most famous king in all of Israelite history. And during his reign, he had some ups and he had some downs. But during a time when he was favorable and in the Lord's favor in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the prophet Nathan came to him and gave him a promise. Now, this is before Nathan rebukes him for his sin with Bathsheba. And his, at this time, he is planning to build a temple for the Lord and Nathan comes to him and he says to him in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, your seed, literally, after you, who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words uh, and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So Nathan, the prophet, has a vision from the Lord to relate to David a promise that his son would sit upon the throne forever. And David's response to this is amazing because he responds in a prayerful, magnificent way regarding the character of God. We have it for us here recorded in 2 Samuel 7, 25 through 29. It begins really, the prayer uh, begins here in, in verse 18, but beginning in verse 25 is crucial language to understand. Now, therefore, O Lord, o Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken, that your name may be magnified forever by saying the Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and may the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made a revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are truth, and you have promised this thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O oh Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. David receives the vision from the Lord, and he responds in magnific magnificent spirit-filled prayer. I believe that the love of God compelled David to pray this, and throughout his psalms and his hymns, the Holy Spirit's inspiration is very evident and very clear. The SDA Bible commentary, speaking about this prophecy, gives us this insight. Has, had Israel been true to God, the nation of Israel would have continued forever, and the glorious temple would have never been destroyed. Wow. That's commentary from Prophets and Kings, page 46 and page 554. 
that which God purposed to do for the world through the nation of the Hebrews, he is now accomplishing through the church. That's us. It's Prophets and Kings, page 713 and 714. Regardless of the failure of men, God's purpose will ultimately be carried out in the establishment of an eternal kingdom through Christ. Isn't that good news? Isn't that great news? The little baby, the little vulnerable child that was born oh so long ago in the town of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, will be a king over the universe forever. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father, but he chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands and to step down from the throne of the universe in order that he might dwell among us and make us familiar with his divine character and life. Truly, truly, truly is Emmanuel, God with us. And um, some quotes from Desire of Ages, page 19, 22, and 23. And John, the Gospel of John says that, and the word, the logos of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that life we have recorded in the Gospels, that amazing testimony of the shepherds and the disciples and the magi and even kings themselves testify of the amazing victory that the incarnation has within the great controversy. And that great controversy that has been raging between the enemy of God and our Heavenly Father, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ his son. That great controversy had a major, major step when it was fulfilled at Calvary. You see, every step in the plan of redemption laid before the foundation of the world had been completed according to schedule. And that's commentary from Luke 249 and from John 1930. Satan had been unsuccessful in his, in his attempts to overthrow the plan Christ's victory assured the salvation of men. I'm going to repeat that for you, church friends and family. Christ's victory assured the salvation of men. Praise the Lord. And that's a more commentary from the chapter on It Is Finished. Desire of Ages, page 758 through 764. And so in this newness this experience of salvation, we have Christ with us, Emmanuel, and his promise of abundant life is available to all who believe and walk in his path of righteousness. His Holy Spirit was given to us as he ascended on high at Pentecost, and we await the latter reign of that Holy Spirit. I believe that it can be ours on a daily basis. For in Hebrews 1.8, Paul writes, but the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Paul quotes there from Psalm 45, 6 and 7. And in Micah 4, 7, the prophet writes, I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. It's true that he is Lord over the sovereign universe, the, the, one of the most Unusual places for God to reign is within our very own hearts. And that's one challenge that I face every single day. And that's why I appeal to you to seek the Lord in all of his wisdom. You see, as we consider the history of the church since the days of the apostles, we see the need of emphasis on the deity of Christ. Many there are today who revere Christ and in their own way esteem him highly, who nevertheless refuse to give him the place that is rightly his. They fail to understand that the deity of Christ is the central fact in the plan of redemption, and that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. This incredible truth of the power and majesty of Jesus Christ is something we explored in the epistle to the Colossians. And as Paul wrote to those churches, he wrote to the church in Galatia, and he told them 
that there was a controversy going on, a great controversy between the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. And in Galatians, particularly chapter five, he tells the church that we can have an abundant life and we can have the fruit of the spirit contrasted with what he says are the desires of the flesh in Galatians 5.16, because he goes on to talk about all these things of the flesh, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Lord, help me with my outbursts of anger. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and these like things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What hope is there for us? There is hope based on the assurance of salvation by Jesus' righteous work. You see, because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now these who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And so we have a challenge before us. And I'm going to do a little assessment with you now, a little self-awareness to evaluate your life. Is your life displaying the fruit of the Spirit or the fruits or the desires of the flesh? You see, the fruit of the Spirit is not the natural product of human nature, but of a power wholly outside of us. These are the qualities that everyone is longing for, yet we can't produce them on our own. We often seek for them in unhealthy ways. For example, people seek love through sex or joy through entertainment, peace through pleasant circumstances and being good to others so they will be good to us. The counterfeits will always leave us feeling empty and hurtful. Below, and with these next slides, I'm going to give you a few questions that point, us, point out the differences. And these come from Clinton Meharry's study of compelling love. Do you choose to love others as Jesus has loved you? If you marked yes, that would be a positive. Or have you built walls around your heart to protect yourself from getting hurt? The walls keep us from giving and receiving love. Next, joy. Do we find joy in being with Jesus and choose to rejoice in the midst of trials because we know he will help us through them? Do we find joy in being led by God to be a blessing to others? Or is our joy based on entertainment, circumstances, activities, possession, or possessions, or even people that are around you? Next, we evaluate the fruit of peace. Do we have peace as a result of trusting God in all circumstances? Or do we live with anxiety, fear, and guilt much of the time? Do we surrender our lives to Jesus each day and have assurance that we will live forever with him based on his perfect life and death? That is the fruit of peace. Our patience is always something to evaluate. Do we have an inner security that enables us to look beyond the faults of others and minister to their needs? Or do we easily get offended or irritated by what others say or do? I have a challenge with that. And I need to put that at the foot of the cross. Are we able to be patient and concerned about others even when we are mistreated, misunderstood, or ignored by them? Something I'm going to do right now. I want to... Do this right with you on the screen. There you go. That's very satisfying, isn't it? Doesn't it look much better? Patience. <laughs> I sometimes get easily offended and irritated. And um, sometimes it's with the people closest to me. And I need more patience. That's one of the things that's a challenge to pray for because, as I've said before, tests will come when we pray for that. Amen. 
kindness, a fruit of the spirit known as kindness? Are we focused on serving God and being a blessing to others? Or are we more focused on satisfying our own needs and desires? That is a challenge. I'll guarantee you that is a challenge. Next, goodness. Do we choose high moral, ethical, and biblical standards to live by? Is that our worldview through which we act and react? Or do we take advantage of others in order to benefit ourselves? That's a great evaluative question. Next, faith or faithfulness. Have we experienced the love and faithfulness of God that leads us to trust him in all areas of our life without murmuring or complaining while we wait for him to lead and provide? Do we find ourselves looking to God only when we're in trouble or in need of something that we want? Having been created and redeemed by God, everything we have in our really belongs to him. Can God trust us to seek his wisdom each day so we may learn how to use our time, energy, talents, and resources that we may be a blessing to others. Let's exhibit the fruit of faith. And I know that Woodside Church is a faithful church. I've found that to be my experience. Gentleness. When others criticize you, do you seek to understand them in order that you may grow and also that you may learn how to love them? Or when others criticize or hurt you, do you criticize or hurt them back? Do you hold on to resentment and try to avoid them? Are people able to share honestly with you without fearing you will react negatively by withdrawing, get a defense, getting defensive, or retaliating? Are you able to honestly share with others and speak the truth in a spirit of love and concern, even if they react negatively? Let's display the fruit of gentleness and ask ourselves these evaluative questions very carefully and prayerfully. Let's ask God these questions and help him to show us our blind spots so that our arena can grow and our closets can close. Self-control, that's what this area is all about. Do we choose to surrender to God's will for our lives, knowing that he loves us and that his will is always best in the long run? Do we confess and repent to God and others when we recognize we've strayed from his will and hurt someone in any way? Or do we just satisfy cravings in unhealthy ways, experiencing temporary pleasure or relief, but then more guilt, shame, and pain later? Self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit in a context of a singular gift that God can give us. One thing we need to evaluate is that if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another, or even asking these questions about someone else, which is great temptation, always. You see, the incarnation, Emmanuel, was meant to show us that we're not alone in this fight. We do not have a high priest who is not intimately acquainted with all of those questions that he asks his father. Although nothing but the love of Christ can be an adequate controlling power in the life, it is true that our love for him is also vital. But Christ's love for us is ever the dominant factor. We love him because he first loved us. And that story of Christmas, the incredible story of the Magi bringing their gifts. I saw a tweet from a friend who was so proud of her little child who correctly pointed out the Bible never says how many wise men they were. In the story of the incarnation, we have this incredible passage, this incredible deliverance. When the Magi had come, it describes that after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. I'm reading from Matthew 2, 11. And they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. And of course, God knew the intentions of Herod. And so he also warned Joseph, he says in verse 13, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Praise God for the obedience of Joseph who loved that child as his very own and followed and obeyed the promptings of God to deliver Jesus away from the wicked king, who was following the impulses of his own cravings and really subjecting himself to the power of the devil. Joseph got up and took the child. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. The fulfillment of the typological deliverance that Israel experienced at the Exodus. Jesus fulfilled all sorts of amazing things through his life. The Magi... This is from Desire of Ages, page 64, regarding the story. The Magi had been been among the first to welcome the Redeemer. Their gift was the first that was laid at his feet. And through that gift, what privilege of ministry was theirs? The offering from the heart that loves, God delights to honor. Giving it highest efficiency in service for him. If we have given our hearts to Jesus, we also shall bring our gifts to him. Our gold and silver, our most precious earthly possessions, our highest mental and spiritual endowments will be freely devoted to him who loved us and gave himself for us. What gift can we present to God? Our gold and silver, our most precious earthly possessions, and our highest mental and spiritual endowments. It's incredible to think about. You see, God gives us those gifts, yet we offer them back to him in an amazing cycle that continues day in and day out. You see, Jesus Christ is the root and offspring of David. And we as Children of God are heirs according to his promise. And his promise comes with power. And so I close today's message with a poem by Clinton Meharry called Discover the Power. You can find it in the study 11 of the Compelling Love Bible Study Series. And I share that with you now. Discover the power, the gospel power of Jesus' love for you. Discover the power, the dynamite power when Jesus lives in you. There's nothing to fear when Jesus is near. His death has made you free. There's no need to hide with him by your side. He redeemed you at Calvary. Discover the power, the healing power of Jesus' love for you. Discover the power, transforming power when Jesus lives in you. When helpless you feel, before him you kneel and surrender your life today. He'll give your heart a brand new start and transform you day by day. Discover the power, compelling power of Jesus' love for you. Discover the power, miraculous power when Jesus lives in you. In the world of pain, the mission is plain. Love others as Jesus loved you. Discover the power in this final hour, what love and truth can do. I remember bringing Andrew here for his first Christmas. And as we traveled from rainy and cold Washington to milder and warmer Sacramento, we embraced all of the love and the joy and the gifts that come with being together. We won't be traveling this season and we'll be sharing a subdued 
celebration at home. But we'll remember the gifts that God has given us. And we'll pray that the fruit of the Spirit will be lived out and revived within our hearts, within our homes, our families, our schools, our places of work, and within our church. This is your prayer. I invite you to bow your heads with me now. Loving God in heaven, we look to you for all of the gifts that we possess. We return to you our tithes and give you of our offerings because you have blessed us so richly by your forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that as we ask these evaluative questions about our lives, that you would show us where we need you. We confess that we need you. We confess that we depend on you. We ask for those fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Dear God, we ask for this based on your promises to fulfill them. You are so good to us. We pray for your will to be done in our lives. Bless us as we enter into the new year and may we come to you always in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, friends, for joining us today. We know that this is a challenging time, but we hope that the magnetic love of God will encourage your hearts always. Take care, friends. Remember to mask up, wash your hands, and remain physically distanced wherever possible. God bless you.